but the fact is sir you are on mute sir ramesh sir okay yeah. yes i never felt this day would come in my life though it's a hard to digest the reality that our great teacher and humanitarian uh, uh, dr balaswami sir is no more but the fact is death knocks everyone's door some day however losing balaswami sir at a young age is certainly irreparable loss to his colleagues students academicians and in and in particular to his family and relatives in fact nobody can reverse the death since we are mere human beings and we must and we must accept the destiny and move on balaswami sir was a fatherly figure to me as he used to used to treat me like his son and sometimes as his younger brother we had a cordial and uh, sweet relationship since 2004 when he arrived as associate professor to our department from assam university his untimely demise after waging a 23 day long battle against the dreadful virus uh, is unrecoverable loss personal loss to me and my family his brilliance a down to earth attitude and generosity had profound effect on every student who had encountered and interacted with him in our cellar department in arts college to be honest his death left unfulfilled void the most fascinating feature about balsami sir is his multi talented personality of par excellence and his broad smile on his face even in crisis he was most respected and loved a uh, loved professor by his colleagues and students for his commitment and unparalleled contribution to the growth of our department his extraordinary efforts to uphold the moral values uh, in teaching profession as well as in his personal life are commendable his unflinching love for his profession made him role model for many teachers and students balaswami sir was born in born to parents bandi devadanam and nagaratnamma in abaraju palem village in guntur district on this day in 1970 he lost his father when when he was 6 year old and he was the youngest child among six siblings okay his mother faced many hardships to bring up her kids and she used to leave him in orchards while going to pluck fruits as a daily wage laborer from elementary education to to his post graduation and uh, phd the balasami sir studied in government institutions and boarded in social welfare hostels uh, it's not exaggeration to say that balasami sir is the first professor who who awarded more phd's to research scholars from our department okay. and uh, he said uh, he told me once he told me that he managed to uh, managed to finish his uh, pg course 
PG course with a pair of clothes, with a pair of uh, clothes uh, during uh, his PG in uh, Central University. And he revered Professor P. L. V. Sir, from whom he was inspired. And from whom he was inspired and always looked up at him in awe. So losing Balaswami, sir, is certainly a great loss to our department, uh, not only to our department, also to the society because he is such a lovely person who always uh, empathetic with the student's problem. And uh, he was uh, frequently consulted by various committees to find solutions, to resolve issues of the students, uh, whether it is in our department or in, in the campus. So the most haunting thought about Balaswami sir to me is he reposed great confidence in me that I could save his life. But uh, uh, which is not in my hands. And uh, I thank uh, Professor Nageshwar sir, Professor Narendra sir, Steve sir for, for, for their relentless support during Balaswami's stay in the hospital and uh, monitoring his condition round the clock. I request Steve sir to organize more such <laughs> events to, to, to commemorate uh, Balaswa, to commemorate uh, the legacy and carry forward the legacy of the great genius. Philip Joshua, please off your mic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to carry forward his legacy and um, and I am devastated and I am shattered after losing uh, Balaswami sir uh, because I was there with him during his stay in the hospital. I never uh, thought that uh, he would uh, uh, leave us uh, with certain uh, leave us in certain shock. So uh, I request uh, my teachers, my seniors, and other classmates to uh, pray for the uh, pray for the family of Balaswami, sir. And I think. Uh, uh, this is my grief. Uh, thanks for giving the opportunity to vent out my sorrow. Uh, thank you, Stu, sir. And thank you, all my professors. Thank you. Now I, I hand over uh, this session to Stu, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Ramesh, uh, for the touching uh, brief. Uh, before I request... Uh, Jeevana of uh, MCJ first year to introduce the speaker. Uh, may I just uh, request uh, Professor Narendra, uh, Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, if he is around, to uh, make his observations. Uh, yeah, Professor Narendra, if you are around. Yeah, I saw him. Well, maybe we'll uh, catch up with him shortly, but uh, yeah. Now I request uh, Jeevana of uh, the MCJ first semester course to introduce the special speaker for uh, this lecture. Uh, Jeevana, over to you, Jeevana. Thank you, Steve, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to one and all who has attended this session. Uh, it uh, gives an immense pleasure for me uh, to introduce such an eminent personality, uh, the chief guest to you all. So as a columnist and writer, his writings and reportage have appeared in many newspapers such as uh, New York Times, The Guardian, 
BBC, Huffington Post, Asia Times, The Economic Times, The Hindu, The New Indian Express, Asian Age, Khalid Times, First Post, Scroll, The Wire, Reddit, <coughs> and many more. As a speaker and analyst, he has appeared in panel discussions on various national news channels and many other platforms. So he has also anchored conversations with several people of prominence such as Amitav Ghosh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Sudha Narayan Murthy, A.S. Dulat, Dr. Sanjaya Bharo, N. Ram, Dr. Sudramanian Swami, Karan Thapar, and sports personalities like Vishwanathan Anand, among others. He is currently uh, employed as the resident editor, Deccan Chronicle, based in Hyderabad. He has earlier also worked with many MNCs like Infosys, Tata Consultancy, Satyam Computers, Indian School of Business, Call Health, and many more. I am profusely overjoyed to take this opportunity to invite our chief guest uh, to take few words uh, to address this meeting. Mr. Sriram Kari, sir, good morning and welcome. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeevana. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sriram, now I think uh, it's your turn now. Uh, can you please come in? Thank you and good morning, Professor Steve. Uh, very kind of you. Uh, thank you, Jibina, for a very kind introduction. It is uh, a strange moment for me to be here in many, many ways. I cannot think of many occasions where the audience has so many members of knowledge, experience and eminence far, far exceeding that of the speaker as on this occasion. It is also extremely difficult to try to discover a person posthumously. And the cruel nature of the pandemic we are in the midst of is best seen by the fact that here I am trying to give a memorial lecture and a tribute to an extraordinary professor and human being who more or less the same age as mine. It is so cruel and so unkind. In fact, the word cruel, unfair and unjust seemed to me the words that played like a theme song all through the life of late Professor B. Balasan. As the biographer briefly introduced him, he was born in a Dalit family in Aparajipalam in Guntu district. To be born five decades ago uh, in a poor Dalit family in a village in India. Itself is, it's like setting you up for a lifetime of oppression, humiliation, discrimination you do not deserve. And yet he was born there. To have lost his father as a six-year-old child, it is like being born with just one crutch to walk and that is taken away from you. So when I was asked to speak about Professor Paraswami and I began reading about him, I went through the videos, the tributes in social media, and I was trying to understand him, understand his, the journey of his pain, the understand the intensity of his desire and the power of his dreams. 
against the backdrop of such unjust, unending array of discriminatory actions, some by God and several others by society and people around him. I cannot think of many people in this country who would have begun their life raising cattle, working as a daily wage laborer, and yet having the ability to believe that someday he will go on to achieve great things and then going on to do so. It is not often when your feet are chained to the clay that you still have the wings and desire to fly. And Professor Balaswami, who have never met in my life, whom, as I said, I sadly discovered only posthumously, seemed to me a person of such stuff. It was indeed the final chapter of the cruel cosmic joke that he was taken away and he just started doing the best of his work. And I pay my tributes to what seems to me a hero, man made of heroic soul, somebody who had the ability to fight and win. And what is more wonderful is smile by doing so. To have a smile while fighting a battle against all of society. I can understand the struggle. I can understand the victories he had, but his smile while doing so makes me like all of you too, without the advantage of having not met him, a fan forever. What struck me most notably was his, uh, one of his works, maybe his peers de resistance, where he asks about the diversity in media rooms. And I am somebody whose life is as contrastingly different from his, that I believe today the best point for me to begin is to ask the question he asked, a question I have never asked myself honestly before today. What is the representation of Dalits in Indian media rooms? I would like to answer by saying one, I do not know. Now, one of the reasons traditionally we would give for justifying such an answer was I do not discriminate. I do not discriminate or care which caste, which religion, which community, which class employees in our newsrooms are. We just look at what they wish to do, how well they do it, and that's all it takes. For a large part of my life, it seemed like a statement of virtue to say, I don't know how many Dalits are there in the newsroom. Today, I must confess, Mia Kalpa, I must confess, it is not a statement of virtue, it's a statement of indifference, discrimination and bias. And I must say it is just a brief introduction and insight into the life of Professor Balaswami that made me realize this and confess it here publicly. If we say we do not know, that itself is a statement of privilege and a confession that honestly we did not care as much as we should have. Thank you. When I uh, shared the news about this lecture, about the links, the first few responses 
came from students of his in Assam. I had to reread his bio because between his graduation in Nagarjuna University uh, and then his post-graduation and master's in the Hyderabad Central University and his work at Usmania University's hallowed department, which it gives me goosebumps to say is older than independent India and has produced more great journalists year after year, batch after batch for, for three generations now. I missed this link in Assam and I was amazed students from there wrote of their experiences, their memories. And I realized we're not talking here of any normal professor. We are talking of an extraordinary genius of the subject, yes. Apranu, apunu, apu. Hello? Can you please mute, please, wherever it is? Yeah. May I proceed, sir? Yeah, please. Please go ahead. Once again, I request all of you to please mute your mics. Yeah, this disturbs the train of thought of the speaker, right? Yeah, please go ahead, sir. I also was wondering how it felt for him to uh, come back to this illustrious department. And this department is no normal department. I mean, just look at the lineup. Somebody like Professor P. L. Vishesha, uh, Professor Shah, Professor St Steve himself, Professor Nageshwar, who we have here today, and perhaps Professor Naginder, several others. It is not uh, normal to be able to walk into a staff room like that and not feel overawed. But quite clearly, here was a man who was able to do so. And he was able to do so because he knew the sense of purpose of life. He knew that the hardest life he got had a larger purpose. And perhaps that drove him. And that is the spirit which must have touched every single student, every single uh, person whose life he personally touched and interacted with. So yes, I confess the question Professor Balaswami asked and whose answer I give is no, I don't know, I don't care. That is the first virus across every Indian newsroom. For too long, we have been afforded the luxury to not have to care. It is very convenient to justify all this on the slang, if I may, of merit. But the contrasting lives that he and I live make me realize today, at a cost of terrible sense of guilt and shame, if I must be honest, that we have just been accorded the luxury of indifference for far too long. And the life and work of Professor Balaswami makes me realize that no longer must that luxury last. That every newsroom, and I have quite easily the ability to say today, what a wonderful newsroom I am part of. Such wonderful human beings. But the truth is, somewhere it had some bias. It had discrimination. And it had the luxury of not even having to acknowledge for so long its presence. This is the virus, that is the mass. I do not think it is possible to create a fair media, a just media, a media that stops echoing the voice of the powerful in the system 
and start speaking for and with the people unless the people themselves are truly represented in a newsroom and i think i will go back today asking myself how not just my newsroom but definitely mine to begin with and media across this country how it owes professor balaswami your teacher an answer an answer not in words but through very tangible action i have never been to a university so it overawes me to be able to speak to professors students masters phds but i would like to ask what has been that one virtue that this great department has given to students year after year after year for so long and created so many successful journalists and i have the privilege to see some of them i hear a uh, far more uh, successful people uh, uh, than uh, i can ever claim to uh, even aspire for and the reason must be the second value we must imbibe while fighting every discrimination and bias that creeps in and that is the value of professionalism and it is absolutely uh, important to speak about it because very often uh, journalism is spoken of as a journalism is spoken of as a crusade which it is as a fight which it can be as a dedication to a cause which it sure should be but it is also a profession and i hope younger people younger people who are here today current students would go on to appreciate that it's also important to succeed and the values of success in a newsroom are no different than the values of success in any other profession for example or uh, people who go on to be lawyers doctors bankers teachers or any other profession they will always be those set of values they have to have to succeed or the values i am sure your professors start to there are those which are personal which is the value of hard work the value of discipline the value of a passionate quest that doesn't uh, die down as years go by Uh, but the two values in particular i would like to bring to uh, everybody's notice one is or uh, just give me a second please. sorry i really apologize for that there's some sound that i suspect was coming in and it's just trying to block that or oh, really sorry for that so it is very important for people who wish to be journalists or want to truly truly be aware of the best there is in journalism and it's easier today it's easier than ever before to access those five newspapers you think are the best in the world it's easy to access those five television news snippets you believe are the best in the world it's easy to access read and even interact with those who write for the best blogs best uh, columns in the planet second thing is i believe more than ever before journalism has moved beyond that Uh, you know a uh, principal predominance of political uh, journalism what should i do if you believe oh uh, well uh, you can believe me you can uh, yeah. also uh, question me at the end sir yeah. and i'll be happy to answer and three of uh, you can disbelieve and four you can disengage and five we can meet some other day on a different topic and debate too uh, all those options are free those are the privileges you have as a yeah, citizen and so do i i have a request please i mean please reserve your questions towards the end we'll have a brief question and answer session don't interrupt the speaker please 
Yeah. So today you have journalism possibilities in environmental sciences. Today you have uh, the ability to uh, do journalism, uh, which is uh, development oriented, impact uh, the confusion of multi functions like society, environment, science, uh, with that of politics, with economics, uh, uh, you can uh, take up uh, business journalism to a sub sub level. You could be an expert in banking or an expert on startups. You could take up uh, just one theme like Dalit empowerment and build a career in media today on just that theme. And at a practical level, you will be creating discussions around it and making a real impact. Uh, one idea I would, as a hypothesis, uh, propose here. We often talk about shaping a country, shaping a society. Uh, what kind of an India do we want? And how do we go about creating it? So this is my hypothesis. Your, the country we live in and the country we will change it to will depend on, in a sense, the newsroom. A newsroom is a good microcosm of the country. Today, if you create diversity in newsroom, today, if you bring voices that have never before been heard, or the voice of the uh, subaltern, and if that sounds a bit phony, or uh, let's say the Dalit, the tribal, the LGBT community, uh, if we can bring in these voices and start bringing their aspirations as a very normal mainstream aspect, I think this will start creating an impact. An impact because the media is most directly connected to an educated middle class. Uh, Hello. Who is this? I think and so. this middle class does tend to shape our politics. The third aspect I'd like to bring about is as students of journalism, as practitioners of journalism, we must recognize we are in an age where media is at its lowest in terms of credibility, but at the same time, never before has a society needed good, credible journalism as in this age of fake news about viraling the lie and creating any, any pseudoscience, nescience into an acceptable popular narrative, which has disastrous consequences. So let me repeat that in a sense. Credibility of media is extremely low. Everybody would, uh, uh, you must all be uh, seeing the very legitimized abuse of media, media persons. This is not to say that journalists are wonderful people or they've had no flaw, they have. That there are no failings as people or as a profession. They are people who have failed. But I'd like to ask you to consider structurally how our country is placed to see the unique value of this fourth estate or the fourth pillar of democracy. You have three other pillars of democracy, the legislature, the executive and judiciary, which are all part of the government. They make the government. They are paid for by the taxpayer, an MLA, a minister, a CM, a governor, a prime minister, and the judiciary, the judges, they are all part of your government to pay for them from your tax. It is very bizarre and brilliant and ironic that the fourth pillar, the fourth pillar is paid for privately. There's no financial guarantee for the fourth pillar and those who uphold this democracy with three virtues, the virtue to question, the virtue to be able to stand against the strong and pushing power for the powerless. And third, to the point of risking lives. And you must be aware of how many journalists keep losing life across the world. And I cannot even talk about the number of many minor repercussions, losses in terms of loss of livelihood, cut down in terms of income, etc. So here is a Spear you are joining, a pillar, a profession you are joining that does, that does help the democracy stand without being paid for by the country. 
and called paid news. It's very bizarre because the country never pays the journalist. So it's an unpaid pillar of democracy. And it is this inspirational quality about it that must have brought Professor Balas Swami to believe that this singularly can be the point, this singularly can be the weapon that can fight the injustices and he knew what injustice was. So this essentially uh, was my sense of summarize of the personality that we have unfortunately lost. This is the summarize of my uh, sense of his angst and work. This I believe is the question he was asking. This I believe was the change he was bringing. A tribute today to him would not be a lecture. A uh, tribute to him today would not be a conversation either. The beauty of being a teacher is your work does not end with your life. Your students are your unfinished masterpieces that will continue. His song shall not be silenced because his students, his colleagues, his peers will continue to sing that song, would continue to paint that canvas, would continue to take his ideas forward, would continue to make those questions heard and felt and make those who were otherwise unaccountable and unquestionable compelled, feel compelled to answer. Like, like I feel compelled to answer today. So essentially this is, this is my understanding of the life of Professor Balaswami. This is my understanding about his the deeper meaning of his quest. And I believe his life, his work, his ideas are too important to be allowed to die. And I'm sure I know, seeing the heartfelt intensity of each one of you who has paid tributes on social media, who have voiced what he meant to you that this pain will remain as a reminder to you that you have to take his birth forward. Subject. That we have to shape a country and to begin with, we have to shape our newsrooms. We have to shape them in a way that addresses injustices. We have to be able to speak about conversations on biases. We have to be able to ensure the privilege that can afford silence and indifference to the voices of those who suffer the most can no longer be allowed to continue. And I'm pretty sure I speak for you when I say, yes, it is how things will be from now, that you will each one make sure you question the questions he asked. And I'm sure the answers we find together won't be easy but we'll be the right ones. And when we do, we will be able to reshape, reshape in small ways initially, and then create a bigger impact and reshape a world, a world in which your professor would have loved to have lived forever. Thank you so much. And now I'll of course be open to questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sriram. First, let me apologize. Okay, apologize for some minor aberrations. Okay, some un uh, some uncouth comments coming in. Okay, some remarks coming in. Uh, please accept my apologies. Uh, well, uh, uh, we'll open it up for discussion for a brief question answer session. Uh, I request participants to probably raise their hands. Uh, the host will unmute you. Okay and be brief in your questions, okay? Please maintain decorum, okay? I, again, submit, please maintain decorum while asking questions, okay? Uh, we are all uh, <coughs> journalism students or probably uh, maybe research scholars or uh, maybe teachers also, or maybe members of the general audience. I think uh, we need to be more polite in 
the way we ask questions. Uh, okay, there may be differences of opinion. That's a different story. But uh, yes, uh, each one has his own perspective. I think uh, uh, Mr. Sriram has very uh, uh, succinctly uh, presented uh, his uh, argument about uh, how there is lack of diversity in the newsrooms and uh, how there is a need to reshape newsrooms so that uh, the voices of the voiceless are heard. Okay, I just missed a couple of uh, statements uh, because I was trying to address uh, uh, some uh, disturbances here. Uh, anyway, I just uh, <coughs> want all of you to maintain decorum. Okay, be polite in answer, uh, uh, raising questions. Okay, <coughs> I'm sure uh, he will field any question which is coming his way. But don't become aggressive. Okay, I see some uh, very aggressive voices. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, this, uh, Deepa Visham speaking from Mother Teresa Women's University, Chennai. Okay. Uh, sir, I would like to know uh, how best the no. misinformation so much is, is being talked about and uh, why the newsrooms are not able to control much of this misinformation that is being passed on and the fact shadows in social media, etc. If you can give your opinion on to me. I'm afraid I tried very hard, but I really did not get the question. If somebody could, uh, Dr. Deepa, I lost your voice. Uh, I think she she just wants to know how uh, newsrooms are planning to tackle this uh, deluge of misinformation which is around. Okay, both in mainstream media as well as uh, the social media platforms. Okay. Am I right? If I'm yeah. right, uh, yeah. Dr. Yes, Deepa? Sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Thank, sir. You. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. A very wonderful question, very significant question, and I wish I had answers. Um, the truth is, fake news is being manufactured not just by some random whim or uh, individual gossip, that's also happening. Uh, but it is uh, also being manufactured with a lot of deliberateness, with the effort, and there's a lot of economic resource that is pulled into fake news. There is a political gain to be had by being able to create fake news which adds up to creating a narrative, which then dents and changes the basic values of society. So those who are creating fake news have a lot of resource, a lot of manpower, a lot of salience and a lot of, uh, their life has become easy for many reasons. In contradistinction, the ability of those who fight it the resources they have. You know, what does it take to tell a lie? And what does it take to find out the truth? Or uh, finding the truth costs a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of people have to work. And by the time you dent one fake news item, fake news would have marched on very rapidly. So what can we do is one, what we trying to do is this one try of course, make sure everything we write, we publish to begin with in our paper and hopefully the entire fraternity, everything they report on television is checked, verified. Second, we do not legitimize or uh, do not give voice and platform to those who are giving fake news. Today, it's very easy for people who tell lies because of their position, people who do misleading statements, uh, people who uh, can come and say Earth is flat or Earth is at the center of the solar system, the sun revolves around the Earth, they get platform on television, on papers, they write edit page articles because of their position. So how can we try and do is delegitimize them or question them. Third is to call out 
people who tend to lie and say these people are liars. These are the following 10 facts they have lied. And four is the most significant lies because while some lies tend to repeat because they are the ones who are, which allow a particular political narrative to march on unopposed. It is very important to really continually expose these. Is it an easy battle? No. Eternal vigilance is indeed the price for liberty, for democracy, and to ensure sanity in society. Uh, and I believe every citizen has a role. Just like we believe the only way to fight the coronavirus pandemic is for every citizen to wear a mask, every citizen to try and get the vaccine when they get it. Same way, the virus of fake news cannot be fought by the mainstream media alone, though they have a responsibility. And I might say they have not done the best job they could. Uh, they have been a disappointment. We have been a disappointment. I have not done enough to fight fake news as I must perhaps have, undoubtedly. It's a failure of the media fraternity. But do not forget the entire society has a stake. If we are going to become a society which will take its decisions on what is right, what is wrong, and make changes at the national level based on absolutely blatant lies, surely every citizen's stake in democracy is involved and they have a right and duty and some interest in trying to correct it. This is my view, madam. So yes, media will try to fight it, uh, try to get those resource, resources, do more research, be more uh, rigorous about what we report. And when we make mistakes, be very quick in acknowledging, accepting and correcting them. But the larger onus lies with every person who forwards that stupid piece of information on WhatsApp too. And that's very important. Thank you. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um... Any more questions, please? Sir, could I speak to? Yeah, who is this? Can you please identify uh, sir, yourself? Uh, I am Srinivas Kilanamari, uh, reporter from Adilabad. Okay, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, let me first uh, thanks uh, to Sriram Karigaru for accepting the reality. Uh, what is the going on in the media room? Uh, though it is a fact, uh, but many people uh, will not accept uh, the bias, the kind of bias and the kind of discrimination that is going on in the newsrooms. But uh, uh, openly Sriram Karigaru uh, accepted the reality, uh, though uh, it is a fact and going on uh, uh, since long time. Um, uh, another thing is, uh, sir, it is the... Uh, uh, position or it is the people who behind the media who are the controlling the media uh, those will decide who will come into the media room uh, who will decide the content so we should also uh, highlight the kind of ideology and uh, kind of the people who are behind uh, this uh, 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 situation in the uh, media room uh, Anyways, I mean, what's your question? Okay, you have some observations. Uh, what's your uh, question? Sir, right? sir uh, uh, my uh, question is, so why don't you highlight the kind of uh, ideology which is not uh, allowing uh, the marginalized sections into the media rooms uh, who are uh, uh, showing discrimination with these uh, sections or reporters? Yeah. Is it over? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, right. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, the thing, Shinvas Garu, is the solution to any problem begins when you first acknowledge there is a problem. And I believe that we haven't acknowledged it properly yet. Or uh, second, uh, 
as far as ideologies are concerned, please understand this. There will always be more than one ideology in any society. There'll be many, many ideologies in society and every society based on those uh, different ideologies can create their different medias. Do not let us forget that uh, social media has come as a brilliant shot in the arm for every kind of voice. What the mainstream conveniently ignored, people today are ignoring the mainstream media and finding voices and newer media houses are being created. Today, a WhatsApp group is a kind of a media house, which is the wonderful uh, side of it. It's also a dangerous side, to it, but that's a different issue. So uh, yes, we are acknowledging the problem too late and too little. Uh, our ability to uh, quickly correct this is suspect. Uh, I'll be uh, lying if I say that, oh, I've come here, given a lecture from tomorrow, there shall be no bias in my mind. There shall be no bias in the minds of anybody in my newsroom and be able to convince and persuade everybody to find the diversity, which is why I stressed on the value of professionalism. There is absolutely an onus on everybody individually to try and be better as journalists also. While we try to create greater diversity, it has to uh, also be a uh, point where people latch on to ways to become better and make their case in a more compelling way. They cannot be two ways about it. And that is why I said the life of Professor Balaswami is an extraordinary lesson, not only about the kind of struggles he faced, but his response through excellence. And there is no getting away from that. Uh, between these two and social media, I believe we will go forward to make change. It will not be fast. It will not be as good as you would like, as we would like or anybody wants. But it is not an easy thing making change. We have to constantly push for it, fight for it. We succeed sometimes. We go back sometimes. We again try. It is not a one victory forever kind of a thing. This is not a fairy tale which will end saying and they all lived happily ever after. It is a series of battles unending and that I think was the greatest message of Professor Balaswami for all of us. I hope I've answered your question, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a request in my chat box. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Ask Nageshwar, sir, to briefly intervene. Uh, with the permission of uh, Mr. Sriram, is it okay I mean, if uh, uh, Professor Nageshwar uh, makes his observations? Uh, there is a Absolutely, uh, Professor yeah. Nageshwar is a extraordinary uh, professor, activist, politician, intellectual. Right. It's always yeah. a delight to listen yeah. to him. Yeah, Professor Nageshwar. Thank you, Sriram. Uh, in, in fact, Professor uh, Stevenson, I. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I was asked to intervene, but intervene on what? So, yeah. so the first thing is the, the related to diversity. As Sriram has eloquently pointed out, I'll, I'll just quote a study by the Center for Study of Developing Society, CSDS, sometime back. I don't exactly remember the year. The CSDS has studied the social background of the personalities in the media, both English and Hindi, both television and the print. So the study reveals that there are hardly any scheduled caste or scheduled tribe people at the decision-making level where they have studied the social background of 300 people, not one. So uh, the backward classes also account for only 4%. So there is certainly a a, a challenge of social diversity in the newsroom. Well, somebody may always argue that I may, may not be born in a Dalit family, but I can be equally concerned or even more concerned about Dalit. It is possible also. As an editor of a English daily, I was one who devoted full page to Adivasis on the International Day of Adivasi, knowing fully well that my readers uh, uh, um, uh, Adivasis do not constitute any any significant chunk of my leadership. So, but uh, that can be possible with few individuals who are concerned. 
but it as a system the when the media is not it, though it's a privately owned it's a privately owned public institution so it should reflect the social the uh, rep- a social society in a true way so that's a big problem and so social di- diversity in the newsroom is a big challenge there's no doubt about it when the study of uh, papers like inadu reveal that the telugu journal newspaper started covering issues of agriculture issues of rural society more widely only when the members from these agricultural agrarian communities started joining the journalistic profession so this problem of diversity exists in terms of the physical representation in the news media not just that it represent it, it also exist in the structure of our news gathering process also you look at uh, we have journalists covering gandhi bhavan more than two three journalists we have journalists covering secretariat we have journalists covering stock market but i don't think we have a journalist who exclusively covers the problems of dalits or tribes though uh, though they account for 25 more than 20 percent of the country's population there may be the that it is important because if we want to systematically understand the concerns and the issues confronting a particular section of society it is essential that somebody follows it very closely and very regularly so that problem always will that we we'll have to the only thing is the technology provides uh, voices to the voiceless you can always present your own narrative using the technology it is a size man la le so the deep intervention whoever this is on size ma itna ik avet ka iti yeah professor nayesh please go ahead well then the, the second aspect is related to the fake news okay. well i i have a serious disagreement with the word fake news but we are using it because we are no other alternative perhaps if it is news it can't be fake if it is fake it can't be news so the word fake news itself is a deceptive description of a phenomenon start in a mit study reveals that the fast fake news travels much faster and much deeper as sriram rightly pointed out it is a political project as two stanford professors have even written a book agnology the making and unmaking of ignorance fake news is a phenomenon which is deliberately driven by a political project where which benefits from keeping people in ignorance so that is the the one aspect when well, it also stems out of the psychology of the people to share something in a very most irresponsible manner especially you share the negative information that the uh, psychological disorder which everybody suffers so there's an elephant in the brain uh, i was reading a book which, which talk, talks about a hidden motive which we all of us share but we don't openly confess or openly express so th- it's a more a psychological problem thirdly it is a structural problem because uh, no longer mainstream media is the source of information and mainstream media cannot claim that it is unbiased the source of information so drive, uh, driving on the weakness of the mainstream media several unstructured and uh, outlets of information in the guy uh, news in the guise of information are spreading all over so when there is an infodemic fake information obviously travels much faster thank you sir yeah thank you thank you for your uh, remarks uh, professor nageshwar now there is a question in my chat box which is this is for uh, sri ram kari journalism has evolved over the years is there a future for professional journalism uh, in the true sense of the word can you please ask sri ram sir okay yes there is a future definitely uh, like i said it is a profession or uh, between its interpretations as a crusade as a or uh, you know a weapon to uh, change society reform etc it's also a profession and good professional journalists will always always uh, have uh, a good career the very nature of the relevance of media the very nature of how traditional conventional media will uh, reach people is rapidly changing the uh, dynamic uh, pace at which it is changing is 
pretty mind boggling uh, you know there was a time when uh, newspapers had to become websites website had to become apps newspapers had to become twitter facebook now clubhouse and zoom at the same time and while doing so find the kind of information load that's coming all this is fine you still need somebody to tell a good credible news report make something out of it all put together and i don't think uh, society's need for that will ever be lost uh, where will you find that uh, set of people you know uh, when any uh, journalist will interact with the j school the relationship is a little bit like the recruiter and the b school or any other school so uh, it's easy for uh, media houses or recruit to they say but i'll only be able to hire the kind of uh, material professor steve and his colleagues have prepared and they in turn should have uh, you know provided for it etc all those will be there but the truth is uh, democracy at least will need them a uh, good media a free vibrant media uh, we are a media with lot of challenges lot of onslaughts uh, i will not get into uh, the ideological debate here because every ideology has tried to control media one is uh, the current threat there was the past threat and there will be new or future threats as well but as professionals you can have a good career uh, and the important thing is to focus on skill not just your largest uh, utility or greater purpose the greater common good that's wonderfully well taken but be skillful if you are writer write well i'll give a small example yeah how many indian journalists can write the first sentence of a news report brilliantly it's called the lead in the last 10 years i haven't met one good brilliant lead writer in all of india one good lead writer i don't know how many journalist schools are there i don't know how many professors are there and i don't know what they teach first sentence today j schools must be able to teach you how to tweet these many characters how do you tell a story i don't think they are competent yes we will take the onus of uh, creating a dalit beat i'm promising you professor nagesh i'll go back it's a wonderful idea i wish i had thought of it and i'm grateful to you for it i'll go back and think about it can we institutionalize a dalit beat in my paper tomorrow itself whether i'll succeed i don't know i'll sincerely try it but there's also the onus on everybody who wants to succeed if you want to be a banker you have to be a better bank banker if you want to be a batsman you have to be a better batsman if you want to play tennis you have to play it well if you want to be a journalist you have to be able to do it well can you summarize a story in front of a camera in 30 seconds you have to learn to be able to do it so focus on the competence you will get opportunities only when you get opportunities can you make larger differences can you then impact the uh, diversity composition that is when you can do greater justice to more causes but to succeed you need that talent that skill please hone it with lot of care read the best 10 columnists in the world today new york times new york or washington post ft wsj i don't care you can access it today learn it and then come and say which paper can say no to you which tv can say no to you it's very possible to have a very good career train yourself don't put the onus and responsibility only on the department and the professors you have to become the best it is singularly in your interest i hope i have answered the question yeah there is uh, dr rubai kanuzia from central university of punjab who wants to ask a question madam uh, please go ahead uh, thank you uh, thank you very much sir uh, i'll take uh, little uh, one minute yeah first is i have a very uh, good memory with bala sumi sir he was our subject expert when we were appointed here in 2018 and uh, since i know him from that day we four teacher three teacher were appointed here and uh, the second is uh, i uh, express my gratitude to yeah you are stuck uh, mr rubai you are not able to hear you mr rubai
Well, we seem to have lost Mr. Kanujia. But uh, I think there is one question which talks about uh, how COVID-19 has actually shattered the job market, and there are some journalism students who are uh, anxious to know whether there will be opportunities. I think uh, Sriram has uh, very uh, just a couple of minutes back uh, answered this question. Okay, <clears throat> that yes. If you have the competencies, okay. <clears throat> if you sharpen your skills, I am sure uh, you can get into media. I think that is the answer he has given, and I don't see any need to answer for him to answer that again. Okay, opportunities will come your way, provided you are fit enough at that point in time. I think he was very emphatic about what he said. Okay, skills, skills to summarize, skills to write a tweet, skills to write a proper lead. I think. Uh, the basic uh, core competencies which are required i think opportunities will definitely uh, be there provided i think we all equip ourselves i think uh, uh, thanks mr sriram for uh, those words for our young wannabe journalists yeah any other question please any other question sir i have a question sir yeah praveen kumar uh, from which place are you which organization which university can you please yeah i am an alumnus of the department sir i just passed out in yeah okay 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 right praveen yeah i got you yeah yes thank you yeah uh, uh, good day everyone uh, sri, sri ram i know you from uh, univai york days so you've gone in gone places and i'm so glad for you uh, i would like to ask you one thing you are in the media and i've seen that uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, I noticed gladly that you are uh, ready to install install a Dalit beat. Uh, but uh, one complaint about media uh, in the last ten years, with so the advent of social media, is that you guys or we guys lie big, retract small. We lie on the front page, but if we have to own up our mistake, which we do after maybe years or months or whatever, we do it in the tenth page, in uh, the, near the bottom, the smallest possible font size. So, what can we do about this? Is it uh, possible if we make a mistake on the front page for us to apologize or own up on the front page itself? Thank you. I'm done. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, you asked a very interesting question. Uh, well, uh, one answer uh, long back an editor proposed uh, in jest was let us have lots of front pages every day, maybe 10 or 20 page ones uh, with each newspaper. Mm -hmm. But you are right. I'll give you a small example. Uh, recently, uh, there was a mistake I did in the headline of the Kim Chronicle. Now that's an embarrassment, right? Uh, this was a big embarrassment. And since that involved the designation of the commissioner of police, that meant two people are wrong because one whose designation you got wrong and one whose designation it was, we gave it to somebody else. Uh, six in the morning, it's a little difficult, you know. Uh, so I tweeted uh, my clip, tagged both the commissioners and said, I'm sorry. Now, it is up to the honesty of editors. But also don't forget this page one, page nine business is also a trick. I'll give an example. There is this politician you expose his corruption, but legally has a right to be heard, even though you're correct, you have to give him voice. Of course, I'm not going to put him on page one. They insist these days, you have put scam on page one, the same place, same size I want. Of course, we're not going to do that. We are going to put him in page seven or page five. So even he can't find if he wishes to. I can't find my apologies sometimes. That is the truth. <laughs> but uh, you'll have to leave it to the media to sort it out. Or it is their discretion, whether they want to be honest, whether they are sincere, whether they try to be too smart is up to them. Good thing is everything is discussed in social media. Today, if I'm not honest and sincere, I will lose credibility even more. And that's very dangerous. So you are right in the larger interest of my own credibility, in the larger interest of coming across as a fair journalist, it is important we do these things correctly, 
the days for these extra smart things where editors decided whatever they wanted and what they decide is what news is, those days are thankfully over. We are no longer the gatekeepers or guardians. We are just yet another voice. And I'm happy that is how it is. Thank you for the question, Dr. Praveen. Yes, uh, <clears throat> maybe one last question because uh, Sri Ram, I think, uh, has spent quite some time with us. Yeah, one last question, please. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. This is Anita. Is yes, it? sir, I'm Anita. Yeah, Anita, yes. I thank the department for organizing this memorial lecture in the name of Bal Swami, sir. I have a very good association with sir. Thank you, sir, and the entire department. And I thank uh, Sri Ram, sir, also for the wonderful lecture. So today is the social media day. So I have my question in relation with that. So what future we can uh, expect for the mainstream media in the kind of a competition that social media is giving because the information is flowing from all the um, directions and the mainstream media somewhere is getting lost. And uh, we have uh, people using social media, but the main information is not reaching in the right direction. So there's a lot of confusion and chaos everywhere. Nobody knows what to believe and what not to believe. And uh, many of us uh, use mobile phones, but don't have time to cross check the facts. So how would we see the flow of information in this digital age where there's a lot of uh, technology and uh, a lot of misinformation at the same time? Thank you, Anitaji, uh, for that question. Uh, uh, the single reason why I believe uh, credible media, now I'm not bothered whether that credible media is mainstream or whether it is even social media. It could be individuals or YouTubers or people who just speak on some subjects as long as they're credible. And those who wish to be credible continuously will have to put in time, effort, money, process to be able to verify. And that is how the credibility will be maintained in the long term. And that can be singularly done only by the institution of media. Again, I'm not saying only broadsheet television or newspapers alone, no. Uh, it can be a small team of five people running a website or a YouTube channel, etc. cetera. Uh, that's fine now, absolutely fine. As long as they're doing a credible, good job. Uh, second thing is ground reporting. Uh, ground reporting is something uh, increasingly we have been sacrificing for the uh, for uh, taking care of the vanity of the editor, you know, to have his opinion or her opinion. This could be on pages in newspapers, this could be prime time in television, etc. Uh, that has to change because uh, we have to show people that truth never comes by broad generalizations and narratives and debates based on ideologies, but real facts. Each fact could stunningly show all ideologies to be wrong. Truth, therefore, is important. The smallest truth is more important than the biggest theory you might have or anybody might have. So ground reporting, uh, credibility, fact-checking, process, the time it does take to verify. So when increasingly people would have made, uh, I, okay, I'll put it this way, the social media, this whole empowerment of people, this whole phenomena is itself very young. It is less than 10 years old since people have had the WhatsApp, the liberty to share lies, etc. So this phenomena itself is 10 years and therefore this phenomena is behaving like a 10 year old. It will behave in a rebellious teenage ways in the next few years. But 10 years later, social media would behave like a young adult and hopefully more responsible. Uh, so like democracy, everything has to mature. This empowerment of people who never had a voice, suddenly they have a voice. It is ridiculous for us to believe that uh, for 70 years, we don't give voice to anybody. Suddenly we give them voice and they must come and uh, start speaking like Thomas Jefferson and uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln and whatnot, or, or you know, uh, it won't work. There will be the phase of immaturity, responsibility, stupidity, mistakes, regrets, etc. And I see part of growing up of this technology in our lives and its acceptance. 
but the next 10 years media will be important because after you've heard three, four lies, where do you go and check? But it is also the onus on us to win your trust. No longer can we take it for granted and assume just because I'm a newspaper or a TV editor, people will believe me, those days are gone. So every journalist, every institution has to work harder and harder and harder with lesser and lesser resources in faster time. And that is the challenge here for a professional. Uh, but I believe the media industry has a profound role in a democracy. It has an important information role in giving credible information to people. And therefore the professionals in the industry, understanding their role and the challenges will figure out ways. And I look forward to products of this wonderful department to make that difference across the country, wherever they are. And that would also be a great tribute to uh, Professor Balaswamy and a wonderful way of showcasing your respect to all your other professors. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Sriram, for patiently answering uh, several questions. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, it's time to wrap up, I guess. Uh, uh, first, let me uh, <clears throat> apologize for some uh, some unsavory comments uh, which came in between Mr. Sridham. Please uh, accept our apologies uh, <clears throat> for those people I mean, uh, who have made these comments, right? Uh, but uh, uh, thank you for uh, very succinctly putting out uh, several different uh, facets, okay? I mean, I think he has uh, rightly pointed out that uh, there has to be some eternal vigilance against this uh, misinformation which is uh, going around and how each citizen has to be responsible while uh, dealing with different kinds of information. Uh, I think he has rightly reminded about uh, how, what journalism schools ought to be uh, doing, Okay, how they'll have to make sure that uh, students are equipped with the right kind of skills uh, well, uh, I think he has raised some very, uh, very serious uh, issues, okay, about uh, reshaping the profession, trying to bring in more credibility because uh, today probably there is uh, very less credibility in the media, okay, and also touching upon uh, the core values of uh, being professional, okay, being professional and try to be better journalists, okay, uh, well, uh, 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 replying to a couple of questions, I think he also made a point that, uh, especially with regard to representation of Dalits in the media, he says that uh, it is time we have not acknowledged that there is a problem. Okay, so it is time media has to acknowledge this uh, problem and probably sort it out over a period of time. Okay, uh, with these few remarks, I close this uh, session. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sriram, and look, for, look forward to more such interactions in the near future. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Moses, uh, one of our uh, uh, exceptional students uh, who has actually facilitated this uh, uh, memorial lecture. Okay. And I thank all the research scholars and the participants of uh, uh, this particular lecture. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay.